In this video, we're continuing the FPGA and system on chip board bring up that we looked at in the past three videos. In particular, in this video, we're going to be looking at gigabit ethernet and how to bring that up and do some simple tests to verify that the physical layer and all the connections are working. Make sure before you continue, if you haven't already, to check out the first three videos. So the first one on the right here, number 96, the first video shows a simple setup, testing the JTAG connecting to the Zinc system on chip. The second video then show the DDR3 memory bring up and tests. And the last video, video number 98, showed the non-volatile memory, this QSPI flash memory on this board. In this video, we'll then continue the board bring up of this Tetbrit Educational Development Board, which I'll be releasing for purchase along with a course this year. In particular, we'll be looking at the Silent Zinc system on chip, which is half processor, half FPGA, so to speak, which is connected to this gigabit ethernet physical layer and then through to this RJ45 Ethernet jack, which includes the magnetics. And I'll show you very quickly how I routed this and how this is connected up to setting this up in Vivado and Vitis, running some example project to test out the bandwidth. Thank you very much to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. The board we're using in these bring up videos, I had manufactured and assembled by PCBWay in China. And this is quite a complicated board, 10 layers, down to 0.1 millimeter trace widths, controlled impedance with a custom stack up, double-sided assembly with 0201 components and so on. So they did a really great job and I'd highly suggest you try them out for yourself. I used the advanced PCB service for this particular board, go with either through hole, which this board is, or HDI with blind buried in micro vias, quantities down to a single piece and up to 60 layers, which is pretty mental, various thicknesses, track spacing down to three mils, many, many different options. And of course, I also chose impedance control, custom stack up and so on. Thank you also very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I designed the set bread completely using Altium Designer, and I'll show you some of this routing and the design in just a second. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to visit the link in the description below, or go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's lab, and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial to check out the cool Altium 365 features, and you can also get 25% off your first license purchase. Before we move on to the actual bring up in Vivado and Vitis, as we saw in the last few videos, I'd like to just show you how the system is connected on a higher level. Then we'll delve a bit more into the schematics and also the PCB layout and routing. Of course, our centerpiece is this Silent Sync system on chip, which is essentially half processor, half FPGA. We verified the DDR3 memory connection, which is our RAM for the system, which we need to run any more advanced applications. What this sync is connected to as well, other than of course the JTAG programmer and USB to UART converter, is this physical layer, which is a gigabit ethernet physical layer. The zinc connects to the gigabit ethernet file in the top right here, so physical layer. The zinc itself has a dedicated hardware Mac and connects via RGMII, which is reduced gigabit media independent interface to this physical layer. And these connections, very simply speaking, are the main high bandwidth connections, both transmit and receive. The zinc also connects to the physical layer with an MDIO connection, which we can see very similar as I squared C to set up the registers in the physical layer to make sure we can configure this properly. On the side of this physical layer I see, we then connect to this RJ45 connector, which also has two LEDs to indicate status and transmission and reception, for example. But essentially, this connector also integrates the magnetics as well. So we have a very simple point-to-point -point connection between the physical layer and the RJ45 jack. So we have three elements on a very high level. Let's go into a tiny bit more detail. If you go to the schematic page for the zinc processing system part, we can see in the middle, essentially on bank one, which is this 1.8 volt bank, we have various ethernet signals, for example, ethernet TX, and we have ethernet RX. Ethernet TX and ethernet RX are these RGMII signals, so reduced gigabit media independent interface, and each of these goes in one direction, so TX to the phi and RX from the phi. And there we get bidirectional data transfer, and we have a four bit wide bus. What we also have, if we scroll down a bit more, is these other ethernet signals, so MDC and MDIO. And this is this MDIO interface, which is very similar to I squared C. We have a clock, which is MDC and MDIO. And in this way, we can set up the physical layer, again, by setting registers. For example, if you want to auto-negotiate link speeds, if you want to set various parameters and so on. The physical layer also has an interrupt pin, as well as a reset pin, but we won't be using these in this video. Going over to the actual gigabit ethernet physical layer schematic page, we can see the physical layer in the middle. Again, we have our RGMII signals on the left-hand side, which is a high bandwidth data transfer between the Mac and the physical layer, this phi. It needs a dedicated 25 megahertz clock for gigabit ethernet. On the right-hand side, we have these MDI signals, which are differential pairs that get routed to the RJ45 ethernet connector. Then we have various strapping options, 
as well as the LED connection, as well as all of the power connections at the top. So we have various different rails we need. The 1.0 volt rail is actually generated by the fire itself with a little switching regulator. We have 3.3 volts and 1.8 volts as well. So setting this up schematic wise is a tiny bit of work, but the interface is pretty much standardized. We have RGMII, we have MDIO and MDC, as well as the MDI connection to the RJ45 jack. Now this RJ45 jack I chose has integrated magnetics, which makes the routing very, very simple. Otherwise you need some sort of magnetics transformers between the MDI port of the Phi and the connector itself. Jumping over to the actual layout and routing of this, we can see all of these kind of light blue colored signals are the RGMII TX signals and all of these green signals are the RGMII RX signals. As you can see, these squiggly traces are because I've time matched, I've delay matched these signals within their relevant groups, so within TX and within our RX. The MDIO and MDC signals at the top here, these are basically like I squared C, so they're not particularly critical. We don't need any time or delay matching. All the various power connections, as usual, decoupling close and trying to fan out this QFN as neatly as I can. On the right-hand side of this physical layer, this phi, we then have the MDI connections, which are these four differential pairs. Now they don't have to be length or time matched between each other, just intra-pair differential pair matching is important, so within a single differential pair. The actual length or time delay between these doesn't really matter. And then these get routed to this connector. Unfortunately, this connector pinout isn't entirely great, that's why you can see this slightly wonky routing, which I had to do because of the way this connector was pinned out. Just briefly, the actual physical layer I'm using is this Realtek physical layer, and there are various different physical layer or fire manufacturers, for example, Marvel or analog devices, but I went with this Realtek one because it was fairly inexpensive and fairly easy to integrate with. And as of making this video, it is actually supported by the Silinx tools pretty much natively with some minor changes. If you're interested, I'd recommend reading through at least part of this if you're not familiar with physical layers, just to see what this physical layer contains, what's it, what it's used for and so on. I won't be going into very much detail in this video. With that being said, now let's launch Vivado and check out the board bring up. If you're not familiar with Vivado and Vitis, I strongly suggest watching the previous three videos and I guide you all the way from the basics to getting your first Vivado and Vitis project set up and I'll guide you through the steps in this video as well, but I am assuming some familiarity. Continuing on from the last state of our Vivado project where we have this block design, which is very simple, just a zinc processing system. Let's double click on that. This will then bring up the customization block for the IP. From the last few videos, we set up UART1, which is essentially our debug port where we can print various messages, terminal messages, and so on. We had set up the quad SPI interface with non-volatile memory, and we did all of this DDR3 memory configuration in a previous video as well. What we now need to do is go to the peripheral IO pins and enable the ethernet interface. And this will also show you how I came up with the pinout, which we just saw in the schematic. For this particular zinc, we have various options for the ethernet. Both of them are located in bank one. And if we're using ethernet or any high speed interfaces, we actually have to choose the bank voltage to be HSTL, so this high speed 1.8 volt logic. Then you have the choice of either ethernet zero or ethernet one. I just went with ethernet one. So all you can do is click this little checkbox, click on ethernet zero and that'll enable this. And we can see if we hover over the pin numbers, we can see what the relevant pins are. So pin 16 is clock. TXD0, TXD1, and so on. And this is how I got my pinout in Altium Designer to my schematic. What we also need for configuration of the physical layer, again, is this I squared C similar interface, which is this MDIO interface. So let's click on that. And by default, it selects this EMIO option, which you can see on the right hand side. And EMIO means we are routing through the FPGA fabric, so, so to speak, and through the pins that are connected to the FPGA fabric. I don't want this in this case. There's no problem with doing that for these lower bandwidth signals, but I have dedicated pins 52 and 53, so I'll just select MDIO here. And you can see 52 is MDC, so the clock, and then the data IO is 53. If we go to the MIO configuration, NIO peripherals, scrolling down to GPIO, we can see we can also enable the ethernet reset. And I showed you on the schematic that we can perform a hard ethernet reset, a hard phi reset with one of the pins. So if you'd like to enable that, you can just select GPIO MIO and then select ethernet reset or whatever reset pins you need. For this video, we won't need this. However, because I have my ethernet reset signal hooked up, essentially via this level translator, and then we are inverting the logic. So ethernet reset, this pin actually goes to ethernet end reset. So inverted logic, I have to disable the default internal pull up on MIO 41. The way I do that is enable my GPIOs, scroll down to 41, 
and disable the pull-up, otherwise my thigh or my physical layer is constantly in a reset state. If we go to the clock configuration and then open the IO peripheral clock section, we can see that Ethernet zero has defaulted to a gigabit Ethernet physical layer. And if we change that, for example, to 100 megabits per second or 10 megabits per second, we can actually see the clock frequency change as well. We're gonna be testing gigabit Ethernet, so that's why we want our clock frequency also to be 125 megahertz. Once this is all set, you can click OK. And then as usual, we want to generate the hardware by running synthesis, running the implementation, generating the bitstream and so on. So on the bottom left, under program and debug, click on generate bitstream, and this will then automatically start the synthesis and implementation. Once these design runs are complete, what we need to do as usual is export our hardware and generate an XSA file. The way we do that is go to the top left file, export, export hardware. We want to include the bitstream and we want to give it a sensible name. For example, something like this, then click next and click finish. Then of course we want to move over to Vitis and start looking at how we can generate an example project where we can test the bandwidth of our design. So go to tools, launch Vitis IDE. With Vitis being launched, what we want to do is create a new project. To do that, we go to the file, new application project. Then as usual, we want to create a new platform from our hardware file and then select the relevant hardware file or XSA file. Give the project a sensible name, leave this as default. And now again, we can select a template. And luckily for us, there are several LWIP or lightweight IP examples. We have an echo server where the Zinc then should just echo anything we send to it back. And there are various performance clients and servers where we can check the bandwidth, for example, using either TCP or UDP. What we'll be doing is using the lightweight IP TCP performance server example. So select this and click finish. Now it's nice enough that there are these examples out there. However, there are several bugs or things we have to change if we want it to work with the particular physical layer we have. As of making this video, I've checked there is support for Realtek Fies natively and should be within this example as well. However, there are some little bugs and things again we have to change for this to actually work and to run on our system. The first thing we have to do is go to the BSP or board support package settings and we need to modify them. We want to look at the LWIP driver or board support package. So open LWIP 211 or whatever version you're using and look at the TE Mac adapter options. Under Phi link speed, we can see it's currently on auto detect, even though the Realtek Phi is actually supported and it's identified, I went through the debugger and checked all of this. It turns out other people have had the same issue as well. One needs to select the relevant speed option one wants. Not auto detect, but in our case, we're using or we want to test gigabit ethernet. So we'll select a thousand megabits per second or gigabit ethernet, then click OK. Then what you can do is go to the top left on build configuration for this project. Once this build is complete, we also have to fix some small bugs in one of the board support package or BSP files. On the left hand side of the project explorer, we can see under PS7 Cortex A9, we have to navigate through these folders, go to lib source, LWIP211, source, contributed, ports, silinks, so quite a long way down, netif and xadapter.c, and this is the file we need to change for this to actually work. Now there are several errors, so to speak, in this file, and it took me a tiny bit of time to figure this out to make this work for this physical layer. There were some various forum posts which helped me do this as well. The first thing we need to add are some break statements in the xemac underscore add function, which starts for me on line 122 and 123. You'll see there's this switch statement here, which unfortunately doesn't have any break statements. And usually this will end up then printing unable to determine type of emac with base address and so on. And it'll, at least for the case of this Realtek file, always default to this. Now this isn't technically an error, but it's just a nuisance because this initially caused me some concern, not being sure why this is happening. So what you have to do is just add these break statements just before the cases and just before default as well. And this will make sure this error message won't print a default. The next thing we have to do is look at a different function in the same file which is called ethernet link detect. And that starts for me at least on line 359. And in particular, the two lines that are problematic are lines 381 and 382. Now this is probably dependent on the particular physical layer I see I chose, but what happens is there are a standardized set of registers and we can see those registers as an example in the Realtek physical layer datasheet. And a lot of these registers are standardized by the IEEE 
between various physical layers. So you, regardless of the physical layer you use, they should implement a standard set of registers to make sure we can set this up regardless of the system. Now this is true for the most part, even though it seems like this Realtek physical layer has some registers which might not return the right thing or not might not be there. And this is problematic because this function that checks for the file link status, so file link detect for my particular physical layer, and it might be for certain Realtek physical layers, doesn't return the right value. Therefore, as soon as the ethernet link is up, the file link status function will return that the file link status isn't there, and therefore it'll put the link status back down again. So it'll constantly toggle between Ethernet link up and Ethernet link down. Now I know, and I've gone through this with the debugger and made sure that all the registers are being set correctly, that my physical layer is being identified. So the simple hack for this is to simply comment out these two lines for this particular file. I know this might not be particularly elegant, but this is a simple board bring up and test using this example. And this is the quickest method of getting around this. Once we made those changes, just click build again. Then we can navigate to the actual project. So in my case, it's the Zbread Ethernet test system. Go to source and then main.c. In main.c, this is the actual application code or the start point for this application code. And I'd recommend reading through just to see what this does. Essentially, we can use this together with a program on a host machine. For example, on my network, I can run a performance test to check out the bandwidth. All you have to do is then compile or build top left on the hammer. And now we're ready to hook up our Zbread board and then hook this up to a root as well. So let me show you that. Here the Zbread is now powered up. I have a micro USB connector, which is my JTAG and USB to UART connection, as well as I have this DC barrel jack, which is providing power. And of course, an ethernet cable plugged into my RJ45 jack. And now we're ready to test this. With the hardware plugged in as just shown, you can see in my device manager, COM25 is the USB serial port, which is via the USB to UART converter connected to UART1 on the zinc. That's running at 115200 board rate. So in putty or whatever tool you'd like to use, you can just set that up to get the console output. I'll just open that. Now in main.c back in Vitus, what we want to do is create a run configuration. So at the top next to this play button, click the drop down, go to run configurations, and we want to create a single application debug, GDB. So double click on that, and we can leave everything as default. Then we just click on run, open put in the background on the bottom right hand side. In Vitus, we can see now we're going to start a hardware server and program the device. And there we go. Now in putty, we can see the LWIP performance server test mode running, and we can see it's connected to my router via the RJ45 connector. And because there's a DHCP server running on the router, we're dynamically allocating IP addresses. The board IP in my home network happens to be 192.168.178.41. And now the performance server has started listening under that IP address and under port 5001. So this is a really a great sign. We've got an IP address. The FI seems to be negotiating with the zinc as well as with my home network. So this is really great news. What this example code now is telling us via the serial console is to run iperf, which is a tool to check bandwidths and performances of TCP links, for example. To test the performance of our link or to get an indication, what I'd like to use or what is also suggested by the example code is using iperf. And this is available for Linux, Windows and Mac, I believe. I'm using Windows, so I'll download iperf. Now I try this out, iperf3 with this application doesn't seem to work. So I downloaded iperf 2.0.9. And this is a simple console application. On the left hand side, I have my Windows command prompt where I'll run this iperf tool on my host machine, which is a Windows desktop computer. On the right hand side, we have the zinc and the console output, again running on IP address 192.168.178.41, port 5001. In my Windows console, if I type in iperf help, I can see all of the options that I have available. And this will also give an indication or a description of what flags we're using. What we then want to type in to start the performance test is go to iperf c, and then this is where we're connecting to, which IP address. And this, of course, is taken directly from the console. So 192.168.178.41 dash i, we can see is the interval, and that's the seconds between the periodic bandwidth reports. So how many times we'll see what bandwidth we're running at. And the default, let's say, is five seconds. Dash T tells us the time, the time in seconds to transmit for. And we'll transmit, let's say, for 300 seconds, it's suggested. Dash W is the actual window size. So it's the TCP window size or socket buffer size. And 
it's suggested to be 2 meg. What we also have to add, which wasn't suggested here in the console output, is of course which port we're running at, and so we'd have to type in dash p, then 5001, as we can see on the right hand side. We're now ready to start this test, so I'll click enter, and you can see on the right hand side we seem to have connected from our host machine, our Windows machine, and now we can see every five seconds what how many data has been transferred, so about 550 megabytes per time, and we can see the bandwidth is about 900 plus megabits per second, so almost a gigabit per second. Keep in mind, this is running through my router, it's running through my host machine, which is probably processing other things, and then through to the zinc through the router. But this is pretty close to one gigabit per second, which is great, and seems like we've verified that we can talk to the physical layer, that we can connect and get an IP address assigned through a local network, and that we're getting a pretty close to one gigabit per second transfer, which verifies our routing, verifies our connectivity, so this is pretty cool to show you in the real world as well, so to speak. We have the status LED flashing on the port and we have our test running again, almost about a gigabit per second, which is exactly what we want. Again, routed through the router of my home network. You can cancel this at any time, but just by pressing Control C, for example, in the Windows command prompt and on the right hand side, the console output from the Zinc has seen that we've closed the connection and that the TCP test has passed successfully. And we've overall transferred in 80 seconds about 8.6 gigabytes with an average speed of about 930 megabits per second. So really, really cool. In summary, we've done a very basic bandwidth test that we can verify that we can set up this Realtek physical layer via MDIO, and that we also have a high bandwidth data transfer between the zinc and the physical layer using RGMII, and also between the physical layer and the RJ45 jack, and all this routing seems to be in order, at least signal integrity wise, we're getting a bandwidth of close to one gigabit per second. Of course, keep in mind, this is running through routers, through my host computer and so on, but it's very close to gigabit per second, which is great news and we've verified this system for now. This is looking pretty good so far. We've pretty much verified almost everything. What is left to verify is the eMMC memory as well as the USB on the go. And to do this, I'd like to then show you how to run Peta Linux on the system, which is essentially Silynx embedded Linux flavor, which can run on the Silynx Sync system on chip. And this will allow us to run a very simple Linux distribution where we can also interface with the eMMC memory and also the USB on the go. And this will be in an upcoming video. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it'll help you when you need to bring up your own custom FPGA or system on chip based hardware. If you don't want to miss out on any future videos, including the further board bring up of this setbread PCB, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you liked the video, please leave a like and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks again for watching. Bye bye.